Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the M365 Council hosted here uh, by Orangatech. Welcome to our first council meeting of the new year. Uh, here on February 16th, we have some um, consultant subject subject matter experts joining us today. We'll be doing a, a nice little roundtable on issues and concerns with M365. Uh, coming up after that, our Q2 event will be May 25th. We will have a panel discussion and our Q3 event, which I'm extremely excited for, um, will be September 28th. And our Q4 event, our final event of the year, will be December 7th. So who is Orangatech? Why are we doing the council? Why are we putting this on? Um, many of you have been to previous council meetings before. As you know, we work very closely with Microsoft and the Government of Canada. We are in about 60 to 65% of core government departments. We are involved in our community. We sponsor the Public Sector Network, SPS Events, and DPI. Many of you have experience with DPI and, and will be attending PDW in May. We also sponsor the Army Run, of which I ran uh, 10K and uh, sucked wind the whole time. Um, we also sponsor the Humane Society and Code Youth as well. So we're really trying to get out there into our community. Um, the council has undergone a bit of a revamp this year. And we have our M365 Council mission statement. Our mission at the Council is to, uh, next slide Dylan, thank you, to create a community for our members to share Microsoft 365 challenges, successes, insights, and next steps among public sector departments. We ran into a wall last year and we felt like uh, we were scrambling and we didn't have some engaging stories. So we really wanted to revamp it this year and um, we came up with this mission statement, which we feel is, you know, reflected the council previously, but also sets a very good direction for us moving forward. We're also looking for topics for future M365 council meetings. Uh, you feel free to email info at Orangatech or comment in the M365 council LinkedIn group. A link to that LinkedIn group, uh, pun intended, will be tossed in the chat so you can see that. Um, a little bit about the refreshed M365 Council. We're joined, uh, we want to be joined by subject matter experts and senior leadership so we can all be learning. Uh, we have new fresh topics suggested not only by you, but what we're seeing at the federal level, some really hot topics. Uh, we will have four quarterly meetings in 2023. We will have a September in-person showcase. And we have a new M365 Council LinkedIn group, which I will toss into the chat. I'm excited to announce that the September in-person showcase is undergoing planning right now. Uh, we have uh, two keynote speakers from Microsoft already confirmed. Lisa Carroll, General Manager of Public Sector, Microsoft Canada, and Jason Bromet, Head of Modern Work and Surface uh, for Microsoft North America. So two really exciting speakers that we're happy to have join us in September. So. Um, Without further ado, I'd also like to introduce from Orangatech, Monica Falvo. Monica is our uh, VP of Operations here at Orangatech, and she's going to introduce our subject matter experts for today. Uh, Monica is responsible for the entire um, consulting line here with Orangatech. She talks to uh, our consultants every day, and she's a great, uh, she's a great uh, proponent for consulting at Orangatech. So, Monica. Thanks, Eric. So my role today is pretty easy. I'm just going to introduce some uh, incredible people we have for you today. I'm going to start with Mr. Ian Taylor. So Ian, some of the previous clients he's had within the government is AAFC, ESDC, CDIC, Nova Scotia Power, NRC, and LAC. So with over 20 years experience developing IT solutions, Mr. Taylor has a proven track record as an information management and Microsoft 365 architect, a SharePoint consultant, a business analyst, project manager, and team lead. For the past 11 years, Ian has been focused on SharePoint and M365 IM solutions, developing and delivering roadmaps and strategies, information and records management, enterprise intranet sites and business automation solutions with a focus on change management and user adoption. Next, we have Mr. Andrew Prue. 
a M365 Senior Change Manager. Some of his previous clients are OPC, CFIA, NRCAN, AAFC, ESDC, and OSFI. Mr. Pru is a Microsoft 365 Senior Change Manager with over 10 years of experience delivering M365 solutions, including SharePoint, CRM Dynamics, and the M365 Suite. Specializing in M365, Mr. Pru manages the change for technical, business, and executive levels, ranging from communications, development, deployment, and migration of SharePoint, CRM, and GC Docs. As a hands-on SharePoint online expert and Microsoft certified CRM specialist, Mr. Pru delivers out-of-the-box solutions focused on business value for M365 and SharePoint. And next we have Mr. Tim Peterson, a business solutions consultant with experience at SSC, RCMP, ISC, Government of Saskatchewan. Mr. Peterson is a business solutions consultant with 30 years of experience working in a variety of information technology roles, including project management, business analysis, strategic planning, sales, infrastructure architecture, project management, software development, lifecycle management, and support. His project background spans over several industries and levels of government, leveraging both agile and waterfall delivery methods to deliver M365 solutions. And we also have Mr. Steve Goodyear, a business applications architect with TC, DND, FIN, MDS Arrow, PSPC, ESTC, and CDIC, to name a few. Mr. Goodyear is a multi-dimensional resource with over 19 years of experience in information technology and information management. He is able to take on any role from solution architect to business analyst to developer to project manager. Holding many official Microsoft certifications, including Microsoft 365 certified, enterprise administrator expert, and Microsoft 365 certified, security administrator associate, Mr. Goodyear is an expert in the Microsoft 365 suite, including MS Teams, SharePoint, Power Automate, Power Apps, and Azure. And that will be our team today. We're very excited for this. Eric? Thank you, Monica. Much appreciated. Just some uh, tremendous experience and some excellent minds on the on the line with us today. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, our sort of first first question. Um, Ian is going to sort of set the stage uh, for us when it comes to migration. So we have a lot of what we've seen at the federal level, a lot of departments looking at what migration means to them. And it's it's really turning out to be a much bigger question of you know moving from A to B. And so Ian, I'm gonna let you set the stage uh, for us when it comes to moving to SharePoint Online and M365. Excellent, thanks Eric. <clears throat> so um, one of the first things uh, when I get involved with clients on migration, the topic of migration is to first try to talk about uh, the scope and what the objectives are of that migration. So the way I look at it is that we have two primary kind of goals or objectives here, and that's remediation or transformation or maybe a little bit of both. So remediation, what I mean by that are things that you have to address or fix in order for migration to work. And some examples of that, if you're looking at an on-premise version of SharePoint, uh, you might have things like subsites, which are no longer supported, uh, or best practice in M365. So it's something where you would have to flatten your site hierarchy. You might have a different set of IM model and metadata with your term sets and taxonomy and your content types and other site columns. Uh, so how exactly are you going to uh, bring those over? Are you going to map them to a newer IM model? Or are you going to bring them over where they're uh, localized to the site collections inside M365 and therefore not across your <clears throat> entire tenant? Perhaps you have things like InfoPath, uh, uh, additional workflow uh, and custom solutions, some third party tools. Uh, that you might have set up and installed on your on-premise tenant. So these are things that when you first look at migrating from an on-premise SharePoint environment, you got to sit down and identify that and do an inventory and really come up with a plan on how you're going to remediate uh, these items. Uh, an example maybe from shared drives, uh, you probably have <clears throat> many uh, folder structures you might be using uh, different AD groups to manage your permissions. Uh, shared drives have been around for a long time, so you probably have a lot of content in there, maybe some that's outdated or haven't been used. 
duplicate content in the course because share drives have been around so long they have lots of volume so part of a remediation strategy for share drives you really need to think about well how are you going to map those same permission structures are you going to keep it or are you going to look at revamping a new permission uh, model in 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 spo um, and come up with a plan for that some of the other items for remediation is testing your network pipeline because of course you have to actually copy uh, the, the the data over. Uh, so where is the data residing? Uh, you're going to SPO, what migration tool you're using, uh, doing some test migrations to really try to understand the duration and any network impacts. Um, and of course your users might be trying to use the systems that uh, you're impacting at the same time. So remediation is often thought to be quicker. You know, uh, I would call it more of a, a lift and shift. You can't do a pure lift and shift into SPO because there are, like I said, there are some things you must remediate, uh, but it is considered often uh, a quicker approach than looking at transformation. One thing I will note, though, is that organizations that I've done more of a lift and shift migration, they often have to come back after the fact. So uh, federal government is looking to use SPO uh, in, in many departments as their corporate repository uh, and really to use it for records management as well. And so if you're looking at doing a lift and shift, um, it often you have no way to actually implement or apply your overall corporate repository and records management. So you end up kind of going back and transforming and cleaning up all that data that you migrated over in order to classify it and tag it and know what it is so that you can properly apply your uh, retention labels and records management to it. So over on the right here, we have transformation. So of course, that's the opposite of remediation. So you're going to take advantage of your migration project, not only just migrate the content over but also fit it into your new model so uh, if you are looking to set up spo as your corporate repository with lifecycle management and records management uh, you've probably been uh, working on a model when it comes to uh, your architecture your content types your control vocabularies your retention labels things like that and what you need to do is pick up the content from either your on-premise sharepoint or shared drives and actually map it uh, into that model so uh, it does require business involvement in order to do that because the business understands their content better than you and you can have a newer model uh, but then if you're staring at uh, a bunch of uh, documents, you need to know are these finance documents and HR documents and what actually needs to be migrated over. And then you have to map that to your uh, new information management model. So <clears throat> for transformation, this is obviously takes a lot longer. It's a slower kind of migration because you have to establish that model. You got to do your mapping. You got to go business line by business line and involve them. Uh, but the idea is that once you're done with that migration, your 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 data is now in SPO and it's properly tagged and organized. You've thought through your permissions model. You've thought through your navigation and search and all that stuff. So you're kind of ready to go at that point. All right, did you next slide, please? Uh, so some of the things that I. Oh. There we go. So some of the things that uh, I normally talk about with remediation planning, it always helps uh, if you can hire a vendor who has experience doing that or hire Microsoft. Um, I know that they have experience doing that as well. I actually um, have gone through one of those with Microsoft and they you know, start off with doing an inventory of your existing uh, on-premise SharePoint environment, identifying things like subsites and permissions and large lists and um, your model, and then they come up with what they call a remediation plan, where it highlights all the items that you do need to resolve or have an approach for before you migrate, and then uh, and then start test migration and going through it bit by bit. So. Um, the second part of this is you're going to need a migration tool. There's a few options out there, so you need to evaluate and purchase a migration tool that works for you, uh, for your goals. Um, you need to get an inventory of your current sites and the data and identify things like, you know, do you have info path forms? Do you have third party tools, workflows, 
large list? What's the permission model? Uh, and so by doing that inventory, you kind of get an idea of uh, you can separate your inventory out into complexity. So your inventory can be split off into a small uh, or easy kind of migration. And maybe you decide to do those first because they're very quick and easy to just migrate straight into SPO. Uh, medium complexity and then complex items and identifying business contacts. So um, sometimes if you're looking at an on-premise environment or other data sources that have been around for a long time, you might actually not know who the current business contacts are uh, who own that information and can help you resolve items, uh, be change um, makers within your organization, help you resolve any issues that you're having with any of their data or content. Um, so that would be uh, one of your critical steps. The Next thing would be workshops to define your remediation approach. So after you have your inventory and you know who owns it, you're kind of getting together and looking at some of those uh, workflows and infopath forms and large lists and permissions and coming up with really a document, a remediation document and saying, OK, well, in this scenario, when we come across this, this is how we're going to deal with it. Uh, and then with that, uh, approach defined, you can start doing some test migrations. And again, like I was saying earlier, you can probably tackle some of your simpler uh, sites first and then move into your medium and more complex sites. Um, part of remediation planning, of course, I was saying involving the business stakeholders. Uh, as you identify your different business owners, they kind of make up a community that you can reach out to and they can support you uh, as you're migrating their areas. And uh, I think I talked about this a little bit earlier. So testing for network impacts and expected duration. So that's part of that. Next slide, please, Dylan. All right, so last off, I'll just talk about a few foundational items in SPO. Um, some of the things <coughs> that uh, you might want to do before you migrate is think through your navigation and search. So SPO has a few different concepts um, than an on-premise or obviously share drives or other systems. Has a home page, uh, an enterprise home page. So if you just enter in your domain name, this is the site that your users will see. And on that enterprise home page, you can define a navigation that is available to users across all sites. It's an enterprise nav and it flies out from the left in uh, what's called an app bar. And so you have a limit of about 75 sites that you can put into this enterprise navigation. So how are you going to organize and what are those 75 links that you're going to leverage so that when a user is on different sites within your SBO tenant, that they always have a way to navigate to the major buckets of information. So uh, kind of thinking through your homepage and your enterprise nav uh, and then SPO has a concept of hub sites and sites. So I mentioned earlier that sub sites is not really a best practice in SPO anymore. Microsoft has flattened that structure. And the way that <clears throat> you logically group sites together now is a pointer to a hub site. Um, and so if you had 10, 15 sites, you can point it to a hub site. And what that gives you is you can define a hub navigation. Okay, so no matter which site you're on, uh, if it's connected to that hub, your users are going to see a consistent top nav across all those sites. It also gives you search scope. OK, and so if you're searching from your home page, you're searching all of SharePoint. If you're searching from a hub site, you're only searching the hub site and the sites that are connected to that hub site. If you're on a site and searching, you're only searching the content of that site. So really, when you're thinking about your information architecture in SPO, you want to kind of sit down and organize it so that it's intuitive and useful to your business users uh, before you think about starting to migrate and getting kind of that IA set up and agreed upon. Uh, some other items would be multi-language support. So <clears throat> how are you going to do it? So at federal government, I typically see either a point fire or they're going to leverage out of box functionality. So most departments that I've worked with have actually moved towards an out of box functionality. Microsoft has launched some new updates in August of 2022 that allows you to have the same uh, English and French features on team sites uh, as you do on communication sites. And so um, 
when when you are setting up and migrating content, what features are you going to turn on? What regional settings are going to have? Are you going to create English first sites or French first sites? Uh, so kind of thinking through that approach. Accessibility is another one that you need to think through. Um, now, <clears throat> I think uh, there's a question later on about accessibility, so I'll get into more detail uh, on that. And then some thought into your information classification and metadata. So if you're migrating from an on-premise version of SharePoint, uh, it, most migration tools can bring over your metadata and your content types and your control vocabularies, but they're typically localized within that site collection. Uh, so <clears throat> I was talking about trans transformation earlier. Maybe from uh, it might be a best practice to set up your IM model uh, across your tenant first, right? And so you can define what HR documents look like, what finance documents, what executive briefing materials and things like that look like and define the metadata that would help your business community uh, that you want to have. And so are you just going to lift and shift and pick up what you have and put it there? Are you going to first set up your tenant to have some type of enterprise IM model and then look to map those items into it? Uh, there's some out of box uh, functionality that most federal government departments want to set up fairly quickly, and a lot of these are included in your authority to operate anyway um, for up to Pro B. And that's things like sensitivity labels. So what I see is TBS security classifications uh, being applied through uh, purview sensitivity labels. So you would have your own classified, protected A, protected B. Uh, think through a little bit about are you going to apply encryption to any of these labels? If you apply encryption, then guests or uh, people at certain AD groups won't have access or be able to decrypt that information. So how are you going to roll out sensitivity labels across all of your sites and libraries and your user community prior to putting any information into your tenant? Uh, also around retention labels. So uh, most most organizations want to start doing some lifecycle management in M365. So uh, you don't have to have that implemented before you migrate, but a little bit of thinking around, uh, you know, uh, how are you going to leverage retention labels? Are you going to use adaptive scopes? And, uh, you know, for that, you have to think about property bags for each of your sites and teams. So there's some things to think through there just to have an idea as to where you want to go for re records management and lifecycle management in M365. Setting up your data loss prevention rules. Um, so you can start pretty simple with that and then mature, but Microsoft comes with a bunch of automatic kind of sensitivity information types like credit card information and SIN and bank information and health information. So you can kind of enable that and turn that on uh, prior to migration and then kind of start classifying uh, some of your rules for data loss prevention so that it can't be accidentally shared outside of your uh, own tenant or outside of your user community. And then your permissions model. So you're going to adopt Microsoft's out of box with SharePoint sites. They have a different permission uh, model. So if you're coming from on premise, you've probably created different groups and roles, and that's how you're sharing your files. Uh, Microsoft comes with three, or SharePoint Online comes with three default groups: so owner, member, visitor. Uh, member has elevated rights now in SPO, so it's not just a contributor role; it's an editor role. So if you're planning on using that out of box member group, uh, you know your users can now create lists and create libraries and edit the metadata and control the pages. That's that's what the edit rights gives them. So are you uh, prepared to accept that kind of uh, elevated permissions for your user community or do you want to dial that back a bit and set up a, a different permission model uh, prior to migrating in? Um, and then a few of the other things are just around governance. Um, you know, thinking through your power platform governance. Once you migrate people over and they have their user accounts and they're using the system, uh, you'll have some eager beavers ready to hit the ground running and they're going to click create power automate workflows and they're going to create, uh, let's create some power apps. And before you know it, a year later, you're staring at, you know, hundreds or thousands of these kind of one off custom little solutions that you got to try to support. Uh, so, you know, be a good idea to, to think through the governance and what you want to do with your power platform uh, and who, who has access to it prior to uh, 
kind of given the green lights of migrating and giving and passing over the keys to your users. So I'm going to stop there. I could ramble on and talk about this stuff for a long time. So I'm going to stop there and move on to some of the other questions. I hope that helps set a foundation for people. Thanks very much, Ian. That was, that was great. So uh, we've got a, a preset question and this one's going to go to Andrew. Andrew, what is the burden on end users during each phase of migration and how are regular operations affected? Also, how can change be managed proactively? That's great. Thank you, Monica. And uh, welcome everybody. Happy to uh, be here. And uh, yeah, so uh, that was great, Ian. I loved your uh, uh, presentation. I was actually taking some notes uh, as always. And uh, as a point of interest, it's a great pleasure to uh, work with uh, some of these uh, smart folks, uh, Steve, Tim, and, uh, and Ian uh, regularly directs me. Uh, so in my role for change management, what I wanted to share with you uh, by answering this question is to take you on a bit of a, a journey and uh, what I do is uh, I help um, transition transition that change from uh, technical uh, to business for the end users for executives mid managers and so I'm going to touch on those as I answer this uh, this question and uh, I'll try and uh, respect uh, what uh, uh, the topic is so uh, the burden on end users and what uh, what I felt uh, to answer that is that you know a lot of these things are the usual suspects of uh, you know helping end users to buy into the migration. So that's uh, really important. And I'm going to touch on that more on the uh, manage change proactively. One of the things that I've learned and discovered is that the end users should clean up their basement in advance. That's always advisable. So you know, they often ask. Uh, do I have to do anything to be part of this uh, change for migration? And uh, I always recommend you, know, you should clean up. This is an opportunity during migration to clean up your uh, your stuff, organize your content. There's no point, uh, you know, that uh, gigo. Uh, there's no point in bringing in uh, old documents or old content that aren't of value anymore. So get rid of them. Uh, you probably should be practicing good uh, information management information uh, uh, record keeping uh, as you are uh, working. Uh, so a lot of that stuff you should be getting rid of. You don't want to keep it. Um, you know, uh, need to embrace the change. So the burden on end users is that um, we want to uh, have end users obviously embrace the change and understand why in fact are we migrating? Is it just for fun? No, there's a, a business reason, organizational benefits. And I'm going to talk about that that when we get to the uh, answering the question of how to manage that change proactively. Uh, regular employees or operations, how are regular operations affected? So I think what I wanted to treat it here is that uh, employees need to provide time uh, to affect that change. So the, the folks are going to have to, from their busy schedule, uh, you know, participate in that change, attend meetings, uh, you know, uh, understand why we're making the change, the organizational benefit, how it's going to help them, how that uh, we're and why we're making this change from, you know, if it's a, an old network uh, file share or a legacy uh, content uh, document management system. Why are we making this change? What's the shift? How does it help them? Uh, focus on those things to help the employees um, see themselves in that change and understand why that they're uh, uh, migrating and how it's going to benefit them uh, specifically. Uh, they need time to understand, uh, you know, um, uh, where their content is moving from and to. So they've got to participate in meetings. Uh, they've got to participate in the old uh, ETL, extract, transform and load. Uh, they've, they've got to know from the source, which sources and, and be part of that uh, uh, migration exercise. Transform it undoubtedly. You're not just going to move it uh, uh, like to like. There's going to be some transformation exercise, whether it's, you know, uh, using tools to migrate, uh, you know, from uh, a file share. And at that same point in time, you know, during that transformation and move uh, to get to load, there's uh, maybe you're going to apply um, metadata uh, to that uh, content at that point in time. But employees need to be part of that. And that's 
part of how their regular operations are affected by participating and understanding the benefit and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, they'll need they'll need time to troubleshoot because even when you bring across uh, and you migrate your uh, legacy system into a, a new environment, hopefully it's SharePoint. There, uh, you know, there's going to be things that come up. Uh, there's going to be surprises, gotchas. Uh, you know, there's a, a document uh, that had a, uh, you know, a particular character type. Well, maybe it wasn't uh, brought over correctly. So we've got to be able to have time so that the employees can study the outcome of the load and make sure that what they expected, uh, you know, perhaps through some form of account that they, you know, there were 10,700 files in the uh, legacy environment and that I've got the same match. And if I don't have the same numbers, you know, in that checksum, I can then look at uh, and identify where the discrepancy is and then discover uh, how that uh, I can uh, affect change so that it can bring it across. And then uh, this is that tag that I wrote uh, from, uh, from Ian. Really important, folks need to understand permissions and how that uh, it's different. And while we're migrating into an M365 environment, products like uh, Delve uh, need to be understood. Uh, the permissions, it, of course, we're all aware that it only surfaces uh, material and content for which you already have permission. Yet uh, the difference is that it just makes it a little bit more uh, aware. So whereas in the older environments, you didn't, you had to know physically where the material was, Delve is going to help you because it's trying to, and Ian uh, and Tim will tell you a lot better than I can uh, what Delve is doing in the form of artificial intelligence, but it's it's doing a good thing for you, but it also, uh, you need to be aware of uh, what it's doing. And I know that at uh, TBS, one of the things that they're doing is uh, um, uh, they're encouraging uh, folks to uh, uh, explore and uh, have that premise of uh, if you see something, say something. And um, so when that uh, content gets migrated, if the uh, permissions should have been uh, changed or affected, uh, you know, you got to tell us so that uh, that it can be uh, uh, changed. And uh, I don't know, are we taking any questions, Monica, or should I keep going? We will, uh, we'll hit questions at the end, uh, okay. Andrew. So again, thank you for that. I know uh, when I think change management, I know I take for granted all the time my familiarity with computers, right? Just how technologically competent I am with, you know, what drag and drop is and using computers. And it's just something that I know I take for granted all the time. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for uh, your commentary there. We will get to questions at the end. And um, I, we do have questions filling up the chat here. So okay. um, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. I've got, uh, I, I want to take a couple more minutes and uh, around to answer the question about managing change proactively. Yeah. And so uh, what what I would like to do is uh, to manage that change. And I'm, I'm going to try and uh, uh, cut this uh, down a little bit just to uh, give some time for others and uh, to, for those questions. But how I would manage change proactively is, um, and, and I think I'm not going to tell you anything that, that you don't already know but it's around uh, focusing on the organization and the different layers in that organization, such as an employee. What does an employee need to know? Well, uh, they need to know about, um, you know, uh, the, how that benefit or how that migration is gonna affect them, how that, you know, and share stories around that, uh, uh, it's going to reduce the the burden of uh, how they store files. You know, going to uh, SharePoint is going to make it easier to to share files with those with their colleagues. Share, uh, you know, uh, that it supports co-authoring, uh, where you know your current file shares doesn't happen. And these are things probably folks know, but we want to encourage that. Uh, we want to encourage that. Um, you know, the employee understands that uh, their manager is going to support them through this process and that they're not going to be left alone. And, uh, you know, communications, we're going to speak in uh, clear, plain language and we're going to help outline the roles uh, for an employee uh, to uh, help them understand the migration, what they need to know, what they need to do to get ready to clean up in advance and uh, look for go getters. In, uh, in those employees to spotlight them and, and you know, help them be leaders. We want to help mid managers. So it's the one thing that I've learned is that, uh, that as, as smart and clever as I think I am, 
uh, you know, employees, they don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from their manager and they want their manager to uh, 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 share that change with them, uh, with their uh, with their employees. They want their manager to be the one to uh, uh, help them to understand uh, where they're going to get that knowledge, where they're going to get that training, uh, how it's going to affect them. So we want to empower the manager to um, you know, know where they're going to get the uh, uh, reports on uh, metadata, know uh, where they're going to share how that metadata is going to be uh, in the new environment, how it's going to be uh, um, applied to content and, and share that with their employees. And, you know, share with their employees how they're going to migrate, uh, perhaps using tools, uh, how they're going to, you know, uh, spend less time uh, uh, filing, share that with their employees. But the idea is that we want to support the minute manager and, and provide them with the tools that they need to uh, support the employees for which the employees are looking to them. And the same thing comes with the executives. You know, they're looking at bringing that change from the organizational perspective. So we need to boil messages for the executive. They don't have uh, you know, hours and hours of time. So we've got to be able to boil those messages around the uh, migration for them and then uh, outline the supports that we're going to give to uh, the mid level managers that they're expecting uh, us to uh, to give. And I've got a lot more on this, but uh, I think I'll pass the floor uh, back to you and, uh, you know, I'll look to your questions. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Again, I, you know, you mentioned that there's a lot more to this. Um, you know, change management is not a, it's a pretty in-depth solution and, you know, feel free to reach out to Orangatech after, happy to connect to you, you know, if you, uh, if you have any more questions or would like to uh, talk to Andrew more about, um, you know, some change management, we'll be happy to do some connections afterwards. Um, uh, moving to um, Tim Peterson. Um, Tim is a uh, business solutions consultant, uh, worked with, uh, has worked with Orangatech for quite some time. Um, Tim, um, drawing from your firsthand experiences working in public sector, um, can you speak to the inherent risks of migration that departments are facing? Thanks, Eric. You cut out there a bit at the end, but uh, I, I can see the question in front of me, so thanks a lot. Um, I'm reminded of, uh, just before I get into this, I'm reminded of a speaking event my wife and I went to in Vancouver once where um, Bill Clinton was the headline speaker, but uh, for some right reason, the organizers um, put Lance Armstrong after Bill Clinton. And if you've ever watched him speak in person, he's a he's a pretty charismatic speaker. And and so he, he gave a great talk and then Lance Armstrong came on the phone and uh, or on, uh, on the stage and he says, uh, Thanks a lot to the organizers that put me after Bill Clinton to speak about whatever I'm going to speak about. And that's kind of how I feel right now. Like Ian, uh, Andrew, you've you've laid out a lot of good stuff here, and I would uh, advise people to go back and watch this again. Um, I'll uh, and, and the only saving grace I have is Steve is after me. So if if Steve went before me, I had nothing to talk about. So. <laughs> Thanks to the organizers for not letting me go last. Um, yeah, so some inherent risks about uh, uh, migrating departments that are uh, that, that you might be facing. I kind of wanted to frame this in a in a lessons learned discussion because what Ian and Andrew talked about is is a solid workable plan for for migration, and you should have a really good solid plan before you get into this. Um, uh, you know, I the, the experience that I, that comes up for me is a is a migration that I I helped do with the province of Saskatchewan, and it was a 15 ministry migration. And so some of the things that that Ian talked about around the complexity of the migration uh, is one thing is one of the things that we assessed. And and what we learned. And so what we learned number one is have a really good uh, migration playbook. So it's something that that um, that you'll live with throughout the life cycle of the migration, depending on how large it is. But uh, it, it, it's something that needs to be uh, constantly update as you go through the migration process. One of the things we learned is that not all migrations are equal or the same size and you're you're busy planning for the large migrations but sometimes the smaller ones uh all they require is a lift and shift as ian alluded to and 
it, you don't want to waste a lot of the client's time talking about a lot of things that may not apply to them. And that's not to say that you don't have to do your due diligence in the workshops, but but just be mindful uh, of a little bit of pre-discovery of what it is that you're going to be migrating and 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 adjust accordingly to the the amount of 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 uh, content you're going to be migrating. Um, the other thing uh, I I'd, I'd mention is just in content itself. Remember that it's not just content that you're migrating. It's content in context of business solutions that people are using on a daily basis that if you think of it as content only, you might miss certain things. Um, one of the things that we came across during the migration process was in assessing, you know, the content and the applications and what workflows might be in play and, and looking at all the metadata and all the rest of the things that Ian mentioned, um, you know, some of the content was a part of a workflow where the the source system was uh, logging transactions within that system that were keeping audit files on on content where people made changes to things. And if you simply migrate the content over and forget about all the audit logs in the system, that might create a lot of headache for uh, financial uh, departments that that go on undergo audits on an annual basis. So you have to be kind of aware that it's a little bit more than the content and that there's linkage to other line of business systems and even the system itself that's hosting the content uh, where the audit logs lie. So that was um, something that kind of, you know, we caught fairly early in the process and and updated our playbook on accordingly. Um, the other um, risk that you may get into here that, that uh, you don't want to uh, ignore is we do uh, rightfully focus a lot on the client, on the end user, on the people's content that you're migrating, uh, but you also have to um, consider who's going to be supporting this system after and when you migrate and go live, there are bound to be uh, support calls come in and it could be further on down the line on maybe content that isn't accessed regularly and somebody then calls up and says, ah, this one file didn't come across. I don't know if that's, you know, not a real example, but something might happen. And if you if you're not communicating with the support team on on your overall plan for migration and what that's going to mean from a su support perspective, you may be hanging that team out to dry a little bit, uh, being able to uh, address some of these uh, calls that come in. Um, also on that topic, have a really solid back out plan when you're executing these migrations because sometimes they don't always come across as expected. You may have to back out of them and uh, you don't want to uh, keep people offline with their current content if you have to reverse back out and switch them over to the old system while you figure out what went wrong with the migration process, which actually happened once in, in, in our process. So keep that in mind as well. Um, and then the other thing I was just, the last thing I'll mention here before I turn it over to Steve is um, just just associated web applications and and workflow and and how the how the target solution is going to be governed. So some of the decisions that were were made for governing the Saskatchewan were around: uh, Are we going to support migrating old SharePoint workflows? And the answer was no. They were they 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 had. Um, you know, a mix of using the out of box SharePoint flows for basic approval stuff and then for more advanced workflows uh, uh, with integration to other systems. They chose Nintex. Um, that has to be considered uh, when you're talking to the clients because if they do have something that won't be supported in the target system, then you have to talk about what it's going to take to. Um, recreate that solution in the target environment. So just think about the, the solutions that wrap around some of the content you're migrating as well. Uh, and with that, and I, I, like everybody else, I could go on forever, but I know Steve has to talk here too, so I'll turn it over to, to back to you, uh, Eric and Monica. Thank you, Tim. You sell yourself short. That was excellent. Very informative. Thank you. So we will do uh, the last question we have for, for Steve, which is, 
what are the key, this is a bit of a, a double question, but what are the key benefits of migrating from legacy systems to the cloud and M365? And then what are some of the alternatives to applications that don't migrate? Thanks, Monica. And uh, thanks, Tim, you put the pressure on there. That's uh, that's good. <laughs> uh, great discussion today on migration. Um, do you want to flip to my first slide there? I've created a couple slides in here. So thinking through really the benefits and, and some of these link back to Ian's original discussion uh, actually talks about everybody's discussion, but the first one I'll start down on that bottom left. You know, you're really adopting that that platform. So if you think of everything Microsoft's made available, um, it's it's a move to that. So Microsoft now is managing the platform for you rather than you having to patch it and, and do updates. So um, you can focus. I, I like to think of it as you can focus on managing the application. In this case, SharePoint or or related applications like. Uh, like my colleagues have pointed out with with uh, Power Platform or Teams and things like that. But rather than the platform, Microsoft's going to look after that for you. It also gives you the latest and greatest. So again, you don't have to patch it and update it. So you always have the latest. I saw there's a question in uh, in the Q&A about this. So this this might not always be a benefit. It is changing and a lot's coming out quite frequently. Uh, and we need a bit of a plan for that. But it always it, it gone then are the days of having to upgrade every few years, right? Going from like a SharePoint 2007 to 2013 to 2016 to 2019 to subscriber edition now. Um, you don't have those those biannual or every three years having to go through that process. It's just kind of always being released. So that could cause you know, there's some planning we got to do for that. Uh, like the question uh, implies, and I think Ian has, has already typed a lot of good response to that uh, or started to. Um, but but the benefit of that is we don't have to go through those big exercises of upgrading the platform. It's, it's always kind of kept current. Along with that platform, you know, you get you get really good integration to these other applications. So if you think of um, on premises, we would have deployed like an exchange server, um, what we used to call office communicator server, uh, which is now the teams. Um, but now you get sort of teams together. Exchange is really integrated in your Outlook. Uh, you get new applications like Planner, uh, and they all build um, around the same Microsoft 365 group that's connected to these and, and can build out. So. I think of it as kind of when being asked the question, I thought of it as, you know, there's some benefits in the platform itself. And then the next couple of bullets really thinking about the content management tools. Ian talked about those a little bit. I'm thinking like the retention labels uh, that can manage the content. There's also things like e-discovery um, within SharePoint, but it searches across Microsoft 365. So migrating up, you get to take advantage of those and then security tools again Ian mentioned some of those the data loss prevention DLP sensitivity labels on how we can protect things and and secure it um, so we get those but uh, I skipped over it a bit that cleanup content down on that uh, left as well it is kind of a benefit now Andrew Andrew talked about this a bit you know we need some awareness and we need some planning uh, Ian really referred to that as transformation rather than just lift and shift he said um, this is where we get it, it is an opportunity and the upgrades you know even though they were a lot of work every three or four years they were always a good opportunity again to clean up but this one where we're actually migrated to a whole new environment it's a chance to kind of um, reorganize things with how people want to organize it or apply metadata and move away from things like like uh, folder names or naming conventions on files we could start having metadata and plan it out um, so, so there's kind of the benefits in the process and adopting the new tools. And then over on the right, um, similar, you know, you improve remote access. Um, while Ian was talking, I, I was thinking about my slide and um, when COVID first happened, I was actually on a project with Ian and we were planning to deploy it to, there was a Crown Corporation we we're working for. And our whole project plan was in person and we we're gonna roll out everything and have a lot of engagement and COVID happened and everything locked down. Uh, I think we kicked off in February and everything was locked down by March. And so because we had rolled out the tools, we we're able to keep going on the project and, and actually sort of adopt our own guidance and and uh, I don't I, I think after February we didn't have a single in-person meeting and, and we're able to be quite successful on that project so 
improve remote access in that sense and people are able to connect and, and we're prepared for the, hopefully not another COVID, but you know, if you're traveling or you need to connect from home. Um, but also in there, I think of the mobile phones and this gets back to the platform. Uh, all the apps now are connected and integrated. So if I open up a Word document in Word on my phone, it's edited in, in real time on, uh, on SharePoint. The next one is really modernizing collaboration. This links a lot to what Andrew was talking about. You know, there's there's a lot of change happening here. Um, it's a good opportunity to help people uh, uh, sort of collaborate in, in a nice modern way so we could all open the same document at the same time and do co-editing. So there's some planning we could do, some training we could do around that, but um, uh, you know, gone are the days of check in, check out, and who's got the file locked and can you close it so I could update it. Uh, it's really more of a modern, whatever device uh, I want that's secure, that's a, um, wherever I happen to be, uh, as long as it fits our policy, uh, we could collaborate and we can all open and, and work on that at the same time. Now, the last one's pretty close to, Tim was talking about these uh, workflows. Now, he was talking about it in migrating the workflows. Uh, I had this bullet on uncovering and supporting business processes. So I wasn't so much thinking of SharePoint workflows um, that exist on premises and we're migrating to the cloud, although that was a great point, Tim. Um, I was thinking more here in the migration projects as we're doing that content inventory um, uh, and thinking through what we have out there and doing some discovery with our users. Almost all the time we discover a lot of processes that are manual, either Excel driven or you know email driven that um, that users have just started doing because that's how they made it work and IT hasn't really noticed they were doing these things and, and let them know that there were these tools available. Uh, so in the migration, there's always, I've always had this as kind of a side benefit, not really a point of the project, but we uncover a lot of those processes that we can get out of Excel and these tracking lists and move them into the workflows like, like Tim was talking about to uh, automate some of those steps or standardize some of those steps so uh, um, they're more consistent or or uh, less of a burden on someone to track and, and manage. Can you go to my next slide, please? And then um, the other part of the question was really, what are the alternatives? And uh, I actually talked with, with the other guys on the panel about this one because I had to think about it a bit. Um, so really some of our thinking on this was like a fresh start or a point in time. You know, sometimes not everything will migrate or sometimes the migration project is just too big. You know, some some places have a lot of content. And so one strategy might be to just accept that and say, we're going to start fresh today and everything else will kind of live where it is and, and all new stuff will happen on Microsoft 365 and, and users might pull their own content in as they need to, but this is a way to get started uh, in a shorter period of time. Of course, not ideal, um, but this is more facing that constraint where what if we can't migrate or we don't have time or we want to roll it out? What if COVID happens and we need to turn things on? This is sort of what a lot of people faced a few years ago. Um, so that that could be one option. Another is, um, you know, maybe we don't go through all that process to figure out everything we have and make sure that content we move over is pristine and we've tagged it all. All new content will be that way, but maybe we just have an archive in SharePoint. We designate a library uh, and move everything into there and uh, apply the retention schedule. Eventually, it'll cycle through and years from now that'll that'll be resolved or users will go and find stuff they need because the search is, is still quite good and can find it and they can move it into uh, whatever their active collaboration area is. Um, so that could be an alternative. Um, the, the other one is really uh, up, up in Azure, some systems, you know, if it's a proprietary system or or something the business really depends on, uh, potentially if it's if this is more IT driven, we want to get stuff out of our data center, um, we might just leave it as it is and do that lift and shift to use uh, to use Ian's Ian's um, he meant he kind of hinted at this earlier. This is where we just take the server make it a virtual server or take the file share that we have uh, internally and, and move it and make it more in Azure file and use Azure file storage. Uh, we could put it up there, get it out of our own data center and at least, you know, it's a it's a step towards moving into the cloud. And then the last one's really hybrid SharePoint. So 
potentially not everything can go to SharePoint Online. Maybe we need a SharePoint on premises. So you could connect, you know, SharePoint 2019 uh, or the new subscriber edition and set up a hybrid connection with Microsoft 365. And, and potentially this might be because of security constraints or um, the types of files or, or the types of work users are doing, they want something local. And so this is a way to have an on-premises SharePoint, but still take advantage of Microsoft 365 and then do a bit of both. Perfect, and that's, that's uh, I think that's the last of my slide. Um, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thanks Steve, appreciate it. Um, I'm going to get uh, quickly to the LinkedIn question. We had some engagement online. Again, join our LinkedIn group I posted in the chat. Um, we have the uh, LinkedIn question. Uh, Dave uh, W was asking about accessibility. Does SharePoint meet the GC accessibility requirements? Uh, Ian, I'll throw it to you to quickly touch on accessibility. We only have five minutes left, but go for it. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, if you're looking for 100% compliance right now, uh, you know, SharePoint doesn't meet it 100%. However, I've been through accessibility reviews at both the Department of Agriculture uh, and in uh, various meetings at ESDC on the same topic. So uh, I'll give you an example. Department of Agriculture had an on-premise SharePoint environment and spent a lot of money and time to try to get uh, accessible compliant as they could. And I think uh, I'm going to fudge these numbers a little bit, but they managed to get 80, you know, percent com uh, compliant in their on-premise environment. Uh, SPO out of box, and again, I'm going to fudge this number again, but it's about 91, 92 percent compliant out of box. Uh, so I know TVS is leading an initiative because ESTC is there at the table. They're working with Microsoft in conjunction. They have a master list of the accessibility items that are not being met right now, and they're meeting on a regular basis to go through those, and it's getting better and better. But the underlining message is, you know, 100% compliance, no, but it's going to be higher than any on-premise SharePoint environment, and it's pretty, pretty good, and it's getting better and better and better all the time. Uh, so there's, 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 when last time I looked at the list, the, the things that weren't compliant were, um, you know, getting down really down to the nitty gritty, uh, very, very detailed, specific things in general. Uh, on most of the controls are being met. Awesome. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate that response. Uh, again, join the conversation on the on the Council LinkedIn group. We will have tons of content on there and uh, summaries from uh, today's session. I also want to quickly touch on the chat. Um, we had uh, a variety of questions in the chat. Uh, Ian uh, did his best to answer those via text. Um, so we had a, a question on how we deal with the constant changing environments with an M365. Microsoft is making changes almost every week these days, which I, I won't disagree with. Um, Ian suggested uh, governance committees uh, comprised of people across stakeholder groups who stay on top of things. Um, change management is a, is a huge component of that. Um, so really staying on top of M365. Uh, Ian also mentioned one of the biggest differences with M365 is that it's no longer individual owners of specific technologies, but an integrated ecosystem. So stakeholders need to get together uh, in committees and support it together. It's, uh, it, it's a much more collaborative effort. Um, we also had Julian Tremblay uh, talk about what is the recommended approach for a natural IM enterprise approach so that intranet and IM are the same. Uh, Ian touched on that a little bit as well um, uh, in the chat. And also David G um, sort of added to the conversation. And thank you, David, for, for joining our conversation. Um, not a question, but more of a statement. Change management is key to success. Yes, we all agree. Uh, everyone at this table agrees with that for sure. Um, and then training, training, training. Uh, the first item of business for myself was to make sure that the user community knew what the difference between OneDrive, Teams, SharePoint, and exactly what each component is used for. Um, I've Ian has had a we've had a previous uh, presentation with Ian uh, where he broke down the differences between each application and what you use each application for. They have different purposes across M365. So again, David, thank you for joining our conversation. 
Um, and that about wraps up today's session. Uh, Tim, Steve, Andrew, Ian, thank you for joining us. Uh, Monica, thank you for letting me tell you that you're going to host with me. Um, and Dylan, who's also on the line, thanks for putting these uh, awesome slides together. Uh, our Q2 M365 Council meeting, our next one will be May 25th. We will be hearing from senior leadership. Um, we'll have more of a strategic senior uh, session for May 25th. So looking forward to uh, seeing you all there. Again, um, don't hesitate to join the conversation at our Council LinkedIn group and please email info at Orangatech if you have any questions. Uh, Monica, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? No, just a big thank you to everyone, all the participants and our, our table. Uh, thank you for your time. It's much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your Thursday and uh, the weekend is incoming and family day is right around the corner. Thank you all. Bye.